Hello, and my name is Philip McDonough. Um, I'm speaking to you from near lockdown in Dublin at the moment. For most of my adult life, I've been a diplomat in the Irish Foreign Service, and now I'm developing a centre at Dublin City University, the Centre for Religion, Human Values and International Relations. Uh, this arises from my sense acquired over many years that religion and human values or a life stance can become an important factor in strengthening international cooperation in the years ahead. So I want to talk to you now for a few minutes about the importance of seeing in today's political situation. I mean seeing in the deep sense in which it arises in Plato or in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the blind see morally. We have to see where we are, what our situation is, and I won't spend much time on that. Someone like David Attenborough has spoken most eloquently about the situation of the planet, the environment. We all know about the pandemic, we know about widening inequality. We know about the social changes brought about by digital technology. We know about migration. We know that the World Food Program has just been awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, which is a signal that food scarcity is going to become an issue for very many people on our planet. So um, seeing means in the first sense, uh, having a sense of history, having a sense of this point of inflection in world affairs, but it also means seeing a path, seeing a way forward, answering the question, how can we hope? And my thoughts about seeing this morning are to some extent taken from a book which I've written with some friends. I, it, I think it's on the screen at the moment. Uh, it's coming out in the next couple of months from Routledge. And in this book, we, we explore in more detail than I have time for this morning, why and how values can play a bigger role in international relations. In the book, we promote what we call axioms of the historical imagination. These axioms are intended not as a a solution to our difficulties, but as a compass, and one that can be used whether you come from the Abrahamic religious traditions, or from a Hindu background, or from Chinese culture, which is different again. And the goal is to use this compass to enable a transition through time. In the context of climate change, that phrase, just transition, has become commonly used. Uh, but the idea of a just transition, I think, can apply to the whole situation on our planet. We're not going to solve our problems tomorrow, but we can set ourselves on a path which will make a difference in 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. The first axiom or rule and now I'm going to switch off the, um, the image of the book. I think it's been there for long enough. Uh, our first axiom or rule concerns knowledge. We have an obligation to know what we ought to know and can know. That's what conscience means. Now, what we ought to know is sometimes factual. The science around the pandemic or climate change. But we also need to know where we are morally in relation to others. The consequences of what we do are not negligible for others. We are not in good faith if, in Auden's words, the tragedy affecting others is for us not an important failure. And this means that we have to have regard to the life that we have in common in society. And this requires us to explore deep questions about the meaning of this common or shared life. It means we have to go back to Socrates, essentially, who 
posed the question, do we need a design for living? How do we create a political dispensation which attracts trust and consent from everyone? How do we answer the question, should we suffer for the good of others? Is there some common well-being that is greater than the sum of our private interests? And if there is, what does this mean regionally and globally? Are we Europeans as well as Irish? Are we uh, global citizens as well as British or Irish? And these fundamental questions arise in all cultures. They arise in the uh, explorations of Confucius in China. They arise in the context of Buddhism, for example, in India. And there are no universally agreed simple answers to this problem. You know, is there a design for living? And that being so, we need dialogue. And the problem here I will illustrate by two quotations. The first is from a very highly regarded American author on international relations uh, in a book published just last year, who wrote, if Russia, China and Iran were to adopt by whatever route fully democratic political systems, the need for nationalist assertion as a source of legitimacy would shrivel. In other words, this author is saying that Russia, China, and Iran have ulterior motives and are not equal partners of the United States. The second quotation is from Pope Francis from the encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which was published just a few weeks ago. And Pope Francis says in section 228 of the encyclical, the path to social unity always entails acknowledging the possibility that others have, at least in part, a legitimate point of view, something worthwhile to contribute, even if they were in error or acted badly. The view that I would like to advance is that we need to talk to others for the same reason that Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest, because they're there. And this talking cannot be done by robots. Diplomats, delegates must have the freedom to undertake exploratory discussions with others, to discuss hypothetical scenarios, possibilities for changes in position and so on. In other words, we're looking for the interaction, not of physical, but of moral systems. And this requires us to go right to the heart of the matter, to bring words and their real meanings into play. We're talking about common ground and trust. And this personal and human level is the only viable basis for the complexities of multilateral diplomacy today and tomorrow. And this brings us to the question of education and preparation. How do we prepare men and women for the kind of dialogue that's going to be needed in the decades ahead? I think it means, and now this is the, the thrust of my little talk, it means that the cultivation of the historical, literary and religious imagination is at least as important as the branches of knowledge that we associate with mathematics and technical progress and scientific proof. We need to understand through having a historical imagination how change really happens. We need to study the unraveling of a Eurocentric and um, political reality in the 20th century. We need to study women's emancipation and how that has changed our understanding of power in the world. We need to understand big transitions that took place in the past, real developments in civilizations um, associated, for example, with the axial age. We also need to, to examine our disposition 
Hebrew words such as hesed, which means I understand loving kindness and equity, and sedaka, which means I understand justice with mercy, imply that our judgment of a human situation is not true or accurate in the absence of a good heart, of a saving or protective instinct that works in favor of the vulnerable. The ancient Greeks expressed something analogous when they said that we bring to politics a sense of shame and a sense of justice that are not themselves the product of politics. Politics can bring about friendship and that within that friendship, some of these great qualities can emerge, but you can't legislate for friendship. You can't legislate for fraternity. There is always a disposition, a pre-political reality that we bring to politics and education must take that into account. This involves a lot of work on what we mean by knowledge. In French, it's more easy than in English because French people instinctively understand the difference between savoir and connaître. So to say that I know the binomial theorem is not using the verb to know in the same way as when I say I know my wife or I know my best friend. The kind of education that produces or that aims to produce the qualities that we need was described in the ancient Roman world as humanitas. Humanitas is a coin term, a term coined by Cicero, and it suggests both sympathy for all fellow human beings and openness towards all departments of knowledge. The Italian Renaissance begins with Petrarch's discovery of Cicero. For the Renaissance humanists, there's no dichotomy between the material and the spiritual, and there's no inherent conflict between the products of culture and the insights of religion. The educational ideals of Erasmus, who like Petrarch was a religious believer, are centered on humanitas and pietas. Pietas here signifying a religious upbringing. In other words, we need to picture more clearly the educational formation that will give us men and women capable of understanding the interplay between the material and the spiritual dimensions of life, who are capable of matching some depth of personal awareness and conviction with concrete responsibilities, who are able to link one issue to another across cultures and across thematic areas who join the dots through a particular kind of awareness. I think I will end on a personal note. The greatest privilege of my official career was to play a small part in the build up to the Belfast Agreement in 1998, which is often called the Good Friday Agreement. I noticed that the Good Friday Agreement was cited indirectly both by Joe Biden in his acceptance speech recently and by Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the commission in her speech on future strategy to the European Parliament the other day. So the Good Friday Agreement is something which has achieved a great deal of respect around the world. And I can testify that key architects of the agreement on all sides were very often motivated by their personal religious imagination. And this was true above all in the case of John Hume, uh, who had a very deep religious conviction, uh, which we're continuing to draw on today as we try to develop the Good Friday Agreement and its implications for relations within these islands, on the island of Ireland and within Northern Ireland. So thank you very much. That's my uh, plug for Humanitas.